Welcome to Just Energy Radio with your host, naturopath and medical intuitive, Dr. Reed Louise. We have learned from Einstein's theory that matter and energy are one. Physicists believe that all systems in nature have their own particular way of vibrating, from the swinging of a pendulum to the waves of the ocean to the light that brightens the sky each day. Each of these oscillates at its own unique rate. The same holds true for every thought, feeling, event, or word we speak. Each has its own frequency or rate of vibration. What many of us don't realize is when we take everything in our universe down to its simplest form, it is all just energy. Join Dr. Rita Louise on a journey through time and space where past, present, and future collide. Today, what you believe may be called into question. What we want to know is, who made up the rules? Be brave and step outside the box. We are about to turn our world upside down and venture into the unknown. Hold on. We are departing our own beliefs and entering alternative realms. Enjoy the possibilities. Hello and welcome to Just Energy Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Rita Louise, and thank you all for tuning into the show today. Today, we're going to have a great show. In the first hour, we're going to be speaking with Dawson Church about EFT, epigenetics, and weight loss. And in the second hour, we're going to be speaking with Charlotte Civic, and I'm hoping I'm saying that right, but I sounded said it with so much confidence. And we're going to talk about talking with the animals. But don't forget, you can listen to Just Energy Radio every Thursday evening from 7 to 9 p.m. here on the Inception Radio Network. You can also check out our archives on the Just Energy Radio webpage, www.justenergyradio.com. And while you're there, you can sign up for our weekly newsletter just by putting in your email address. It is that simple, and it'll keep you informed of all the upcoming programs we have on the show. You can also like Just Energy Radio on Facebook or we've been putting archives on our YouTube channel, Just Energy Radio. And if you find it, do subscribe to the channel because we put other stuff on that channel as well. Um, also, one of the things that's available from the Inception Radio Network is you can download the little Inception Radio Network app to your phone um, just by going to the Play Store or the Win- Apple App Store. I don't know. I'm not an iPhone person. So the Apple Store and downloading it because it's free. And then you can listen to all the archives um, in your car or at work or while you're waiting for something. And that is just so cool. Anyway, a couple of little announcements, and then we're going to get Dawson on the air. So the next week or so is going to be busy, busy, busy for me. On Saturday, I'm going to be speaking at the Alchemy event in Los Angeles, California. I'll be speaking on Saturday, uh, June 15th. It's a two-day event. It's June 15th and 16th. Um, but you can also, if you go to, if you're not in the Los Angeles area and you know can't make it there but want to attend, they are actually live streaming the inv- entire conference. And if you go to the website, uh, alchemyevent.com, for, I think, 50 bucks, you can live stream the entire event to your computer. So that, I think, is really cool. And I think that's going to be kind of the way of the future. So we can all participate from the comfort of our own home. And then uh, the following week, on June 21st and 22nd, I'm going to be doing a little mini speaking tour in New York. And so I'll be in New Paul's, New York on the 21st at Inquiring Minds Bookstore in Albany, New York on the 27th, 22nd at the Barnes & Noble doing a little presentation, signing a few books, which, as you know, if you listen to the show, is priceless. So if you're in the neighborhood or in that, you know, multiple state area, I mean, think about it. It's only like an hour drive from almost half the country to New York. Um, Stop by and get your book signed and come visit and hang out and mention that you've heard, you know, me live here on the Inception Radio Network. Anyway, let me tell you a little bit about Dawson and get him on the air. Dawson Church, Ph.D., founded Soul Medicine Institute to research and teach emerging psychological and medical techniques that can yield fast and radical cures. His book, The Genie in Your Genes, pioneers the field of epigenetics, explaining the remarkable self-healing mechanisms now emerging from the science. 
He has conducted many scientific studies of energy therapies and shares how to apply these breakthroughs to health. So the author of Genie in Your Genes, his website is www.eftuniverse.com. Dawson Church. Hey, Dawson, how are you? I am doing great, thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for coming back on the show. You know, your, your peeps contacted me, and I'm like, wait a minute, he's been on the show. I mean, but it's been like a million years. <laughs> it <laughs> seems right. like it. Time flies. It does. It does. So anyway, um, I think we're going to have a really great conversation. There's just been so much going on, um, you know, with it breakthroughs, I think, in, you know, alternative health and energy medicine that, um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that you can kind of bring us up to date with some of the really astound, astounding findings that have been to. coming out. Um, yeah. But let's start here. Um, all right, I have like really bad phonics skills, but I could figure out how to pronounce epigenetics if I really thought about it. Um, Very good. But I, I was so proud of myself. You have to. <laughs> 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 but um, but for the listeners, what is that? That's not a word that we just toss around. It isn't now, but it will be more and more in the future. And it's a new field. It's only about twenty years old, and really gathered steam in the last 10 years and of course we all know what genetics is that we know that our genes have these molecular blueprints that tell our bodies how to build certain molecules so for example your body needs to make a certain molecule to produce energy or to help metabolize food or whatever it that the uh, the blueprint for that molecule is locked in a gene and when that gene is turned on your body then knows how to produce that that molecule is called gene expression. But um, for most of the 20th century, since the discovery of genes just after World War II, people thought that those genes turned on and turned off spontaneously, that the, the, uh, the, the instructions for when to encode a certain molecule were in the genes themselves. But what was discovered starting, there are lots of pieces of evidence that, that began to crop up showing that that wasn't true. And so eventually we came to understand in a series of really interesting experiments that um, there are factors from outside the genome, outside the cell, outside the body even, that trigger genes turning on and off called gene expression. So things from outside your body, things from outside the cell actually can give your genes the instructions to turn on or turn off. And that is really amazing, right? Like, for example, in one famous experiment, a friend of mine from Duke University called Randy Jervil, he changed the gene expression of one gene, a single gene in mice. And the mice that were different based on this one genetic change produced from outside the genome had much higher rates of cancer, had much higher rates of obesity, had much shorter lifespans just based on one gene being turned off from a completely separate environmental impact. And this, this, this showed people how, um, how, 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 how important this phenomenon is. So epigenetics is, is now has been the subject of um, like a front page article, front cover article in Time magazine. It's been hitting the, the newspapers. And more and more you'll hear and people will think about ways in which our genes are turned on and off that has, have nothing to do with stuff happening inside the cell, inside the body, but have a lot to do with the environment around the cell and around the gene. Okay. Um, I mean, that's a really interesting study. And so, you know, uh, my, you know, my little scientific mind goes, but how did they introduce that genetic change? Was it part of... I, I'm, I'm having you. a little bit of... Uh, yeah, tell me. Yeah. Tell me everything. Well, um, the... In that particular case, they they silenced a certain gene by having uh, another molecular group bond to part of that, that DNA sequence. And so what happens is that there are groups called methyl groups, metals, and these molecules, when they stick to a strand of DNA, they inhibit it from expressing or turning on. And there are other groups called acetyl groups that actually facilitate uh, a strand of DNA turning on. So what happens is that if you have lots of metals 
in certain parts of the body or certain parts of the genome, then that shuts down certain genes. If you have lots of acetyl groups, that it facilitates them. So what he did was he actually fed the mothers of these mice a certain diet, and that diet was rich in methyl groups. The methyl group silenced that gene, and that resulted in these big changes in the body. Now, that's doing it with a signal from the environment that comes in the form of molecules in food. So molecules in food can have that big an impact on our health. But what I talk about in my book, Gene in Your Genes, is that the same thing occurs based on stress. When you have stress, you actually shift the expression of genes. And it's really easy to figure this out because, for example, if you have, um, say you have an argument with somebody and you feel angry and upset as a result of the argument, what's happening is that in your body, you're producing lots of stress hormones like adrenaline and cortisol. And if you have prolonged stress or prolonged trauma in your life, you get into a place where you're producing lots of adrenaline, lots of cortisol for prolonged periods of time, chronic stress, chronic high cortisol. So what's happening is this epigenetic input <clears throat> of that emotional stress or that negative thinking or that conflict is producing a change in which genes are turned on, which genes are turned off, and it's telling the genes that make adrenaline and cortisol to turn on. So you have high amounts of cortisol, high amounts of adrenaline in people who are stressed because that stress sends an epigenetic signal to those strands of DNA to turn on and make lots and lots of the stress hormones like cortisol. So that, that's an example. One example is from food, but the other example is just from emotions, your emotional state, your core beliefs, your spiritual practice, all of these things day by day, moment by moment actually, are producing these epigenetic shifts in the way your cells function. Okay. But let me kind of throw something out at you. So, I mean, I can see how food, when we eat certain kinds of foods, um, it would create some kind of a chemistry inside of us. But when we have, you know, if we're in a state of stress, we're in, you know, whatever that emotional state is, doesn't that create some kind of a chemistry in us too? And is it acting on it in the same way? You know, is it based on we're creating, you know, our emotions are creating this chemistry and then this chemistry is kind of going into the cell to produce the change in the cell or am I missing something? Yes, the emotion, emotions are, emotions produce messenger, messenger molecules. So as, if you feel good, you may have a whole bunch of endorphins flushing around in your brain and in your body. So feeling good produces these messenger molecules that tell your body you're safe, you're okay, and it actually shuts down the the gene expression of those genes that have the blueprints, the code, the genetic code for those stress hormones like cortisol and adrenaline. So if you're feeling good, you, that good emotional state produces these, these, these messenger molecules that then send a signal to those parts of the, the, the endocrine system that produce those hormones to, to, to quit. No need to go ahead and, and make all these stress hormones. But when you again think that negative thought, have a negative experience, have a negative memory, you have the opposite phenomenon. And so dynamically, moment by moment, thought by thought, feeling by feeling, we're actually shifting the expression of key genes, key hormones every day, every moment by what we think, feel, and believe. So I guess everybody needs to have like good mojo all the time so that they have lots of good endorphins and they're keeping themselves healthy. You know, um, Dr. Mark Hyman said recently, if you knew what was happening in your body when you think a negative thought, you would never do it again in your life. I mean, you're, <laughs> you, you, you are sitting in, 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 in place, such a chain of biochemical changes. For example, in our, in our workshops, um, my main uh, technique I teach is EFT. And at EFTUniverse.com, our website, we offer tons of workshops every year. And so at workshops sometimes, I'll hook people up to a monitor that is monitoring their physiology and especially their stress level. And it has like a stop sign, it has like a, a, a stop light, it has a red, an orange, and a green light. So I'll get them into this nice green state, they're all nice and relaxed, and, and they've got these, these uh, electrodes hooked up to their body so we can tell that they're really nice and relaxed, their breathing's deep, their galvanic skin response is relaxed. Then I say to them, Think 
one negative thought and bingo, they go to orange and to red right away. You think the negative thought and you're sitting in place a huge cascade of neurological, hormonal changes in your body and it's, it's happening not based on any kind of um, event happening to you. It's only based on your thoughts. So every time you think a negative thought, every time you have a negative belief, say a negative word, you're making those kinds of changes in your body's physiology. So basically what you're saying is that every time you have, you have a negative thought, it's kind of like you're eating a hot dog, which you really don't know what's in that, or some potted meat or McDonald's, except on the inside part. Without well, the fun. You know, if, 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 <laughs> if I, if I did, if, I, I'm not, not much of a betting person, but um, if I were to take odds on the, on the longevity and the, and the health span of somebody who ate junk food all the time and nothing but junk food, but did a lot of positive thinking, and a second person who ate the, in the most healthy way possible but was filled with negative thinking, I would put my odds on the guy eating the McDonald's hamburgers because um, the... But people worry about supplements and, and these micronutrients. Are you getting the right amount of you know, COQ10? Is krill fish oil better than, um, than other kinds of fish oil? And, and they're worried about these really pretty small molecular differences between these supplements. Uh, when you think that negative thought, you have a much, much bigger effect on your physiology. So um, your thinking is producing effects infinitely greater than those produced by diet or even exercise. So uh, you, you need a good diet. You need ex- I'm not just putting those things down, but I'm saying that obsessing about those external um, ways of influencing your gene expression when you're not in control of the internal emotional parts of gene expression is really uh, a misplaced emphasis. It's, it's so important. A strong spiritual practice is important. Uh, being at harmony, being at peace within is important. Good relationships with people around you are important. All of these things contribute to your quality of life and a low stress level, and that has tremendously beneficial changes that it makes to your gene expression and the hormones in your body. Well, and your life that. Yeah, and I've had a number of clients who were very rigid vegetarians, you know, and they have health stuff going on. And I'll suggest, well, you might want to take this or, you know, God forbid, fish oil. Um, but then, you know, you make a recommendation like, well, that comes in a gel cap. You know, it's like I, you're, I was you're dying, a, a, okay, and you're not going to take yeah. a gel cap because you're a vegetarian. Come on. Well, I had a funny experience a few years back. My mentor is a wonderful physician called Dr. Norman Sheeney. And Norm trained at Harvard University as a neurosurgeon. He was on my dissertation committee. And um, I co-authored a book with him called Soul Medicine. And we used to speak every year at an at a event called the Whole Life Expo. And at one expo, we were doing book signing. So Norm was sitting there signing one of his books. I was sitting there signing a book next to Norm. We were chatting as we, in between signing books for people. And then next to us was a person I will not name, but is a very well-known um, uh, diet writer. And he has several really, really best-selling books on, um, on vegetarianism and, and clean diet and, uh, and the good books. But we listened to people who weren't walking up to Norm and me to get the book signed. They were walking up to him to get their book signed. And they were mostly young people, mostly in their 20s. And they were talking to him. And we sat there absolutely horrified by the parade of health problems they were telling him they were having. So they'd come up and they, they would say, I'm fatigued all the time. Um, I'm having problems with my teeth. I'm having problems with my skin. I don't heal properly. My immune system is really suppressed. I'm getting... Uh, six or ten colds every year. I don't, my, my wound healing is slow. So they were describing this, and then again, these were not people in their 60s or 70s. These were people in their 20s for the most part. So um, it really, that little event drove home to us that you can do all of those external bits of tinkering with those micronutrients and, and food, but if you don't have the basics right, especially attitude, um, you can really compromise your health and uh, I mean, be missing a big piece of the puzzle. I, I agree 
I mean, I, I'm a naturopath, and so my clients make the assumption that I must be a vegetarian or something. And for me, I found it didn't work. I mean, it just didn't work for me. And I find that I tend to eat much more healthy if I include real, like, you know, animal protein in my diet. I find that my diet tends to be more balanced. I don't go through that, you really shouldn't eat that. You really shouldn't eat that. And so you don't go through those whole mental gyrations of beating yourself up about, should I do this or shouldn't I do this? You know, you just kind of go with what your body wants and what it needs and honor that. Well, you know, the, the sad thing is that most of us have been trained out of listening to what our body needs and what. So it's great if you can do it. And most of us have been used to overriding what our body needs or wants. And so in all kinds of ways, we get invalidated when we're children early on. And so our whole enculturation actually tunes us out of listening to our body's needs. So we try and tell some, someone we're hungry, and they say, well, well, it's only an hour and a half till dinner time, so just, just hang on there. Or uh, big, big problems, thirst, we feel thirsty, and yet we, we misread it as hunger, or we don't drink right away, we don't, do, we don't drink enough. Um, so we grow up. Often, when people begin our, our EFT and weight loss program, they often are so out of touch with their body signals, they have no idea what their bodies are telling them. They, they, they've trained themselves out of it for so many years, they don't have a clue what the bodies are telling them. Now, the good news is that as you listen to those signals, as you, it's like practice, it's like learning, learning a foreign language. If you attune your ear and start to listen, then you start to be able to pick up the meaning of a few words or a few phrases, then a few more phrases, then after a while you become fluent, then you become aware of the subtleties of meaning you weren't aware of before. Listening to your body is just the same thing, same, same thing. If, you're, if, you're, if, it's, if it's a foreign language to you, you start to listen to it and then gradually become more and more and more attuned to it. And it often starts to tell you really counterintuitive things. One woman who was uh, pregnant, she was a vegetarian and um, doing pretty well on a vegetarian diet, but tuning into her body, she suddenly realized that she was giving this very strong signal to eat meat. So she did, and she realized it was just part of where she was in the cycle of gestation that she needed that extra protein boost. So if you, if you do get in the habit of listening, then you find your body does tell you, and your tastes change naturally. Like, for example, we have many people who've, who've gotten off sugar, not by willpower, not by trying to, just by listening. And after a while, you get to the point where um, you, you just don't crave those things anymore. Amen to that. So, all right, so I'm going to share a story with everybody. I'm glad my husband's not listening tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I so might tell him. To, well, it, you know, it's kind of a fact, but he um, he would consume a lot of sugar. I mean, to the point that, I mean, my teeth would start hurting with how much sugar he would consume. And I had decided, you know, he's responsible for his own health, even though I might cringe and maybe make a comment here or there, but I wasn't going to get in his face. And... um he had a little bit of a scare and cut the sugar out. And he has gotten to the place where even putting some stevia in his iced tea is too sweet. Mm. And he would put like a tablespoon of sugar in his coffee, one cup. And I was like, Ugh. Yeah. Well, you, you, you That's really huge. Do. That's huge. You know, in our, our live EFT workshops, one of the funny things I do is we have at the end of the second day – we have a craving exercise, and we actually bring in chocolate, and we have people rate their degree of craving. So you, you score your craving on a scale of 0 to 10. So how much are you craving with chocolate right now? Is it 0? Is it 10? And a lot of people are high. Some people say 0 to 10, what's your number? They say it's 85. <laughs> it's way over 10. They so want that chocolate. But we do a little bit of EFT with them, and on average, we're, we're testing them in about half an hour after their first response. And almost all of them go down to close to a zero for the chocolate. In fact, some people who were just 10 out of 10 craving that chocolate, after they've done some EFT, often they're down to a zero. And the freaky thing, Rita, is that after each EFT workshop, people then, you know, we, we end, end the workshop, they're, they're chatting with each other, they say their goodbyes, they leave the room. We're, clear, we're cleaning up the room after the workshop. We throw away 
tons and tons of chocolate. People completely lose interest in the chocolate because the chocolate wasn't really the chocolate they were craving. It was a mask for anxiety, for depression. It was simple self-medication. All of those sugar cravings often have nothing to do with the sugar itself. They have to do with unmet emotional needs. And you figure out the unmet emotional part of it, and suddenly the sugar craving just goes away. So in, in clinical trials of EFT, the average reduction in cravings for sweets, chocolate, sugary snacks, and so on, the, a- the average reduction is, um, is 80, 83% in that half hour, and that's highly significant. It has a p-value of 0.0001. one one possibility in 10,000 that was also due to chance. So really a lot of research evidence showing that uh, it's, 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 you know, this is kind of an artificial craving that we, 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 again, culturally we acquire growing up, but our bodies really do some, do some emotional work, do some spiritual work. Your bodies really do not want the stuff. Well, and let, let's back up because you keep using the term EFT. And for the listeners that haven't ever heard of that, what is EFT? Well, EFT is short for Emotional Freedom Techniques or tapping, because what it involves is it involves tapping with your fingertips on acupuncture points. So just like in Oriental medicine, acupuncturists insert needles into the points. With EFT, we tap on 12 of these points. We also do this in a very structured way. We tap while we're thinking about negative events, negative people, negative childhood memories. So we find that, that people, when they combine processing an event mentally and emotionally, with tapping, that they very rapidly lose the emotional charge they have around that negative event. And it's, it's spread like wildfire. We, we have a huge collection. We have over 10,000 stories on our site in 15 languages and um, just huge numbers of stories of, of people from all over the world who have used EFT for all kinds of, of, of problems. And it removes the stress component of their problems. So if they have a headache, then their stress goes down, the headache tends to get better. Or if they have something like you know, back pain, neck pain, if they have depression or anxiety, part of that's always involving stress. So EFT removes the stress component of that. And uh, again, the research is really compelling that when you take away the stress part of your experience, you may still have some pain or some craving left, but it's pretty small. The bulk of what you think of as, as that problem is really emotional, not physical. Where did EFT come from? Um, I mean, there's the acupuncture part, um, which obviously is thousands of years old, but where did they come up with the thought to combine, you know, activating the acupuncture, the meridians, as well as bringing in the emotional part to help to release that? Yeah, well, um, needling, of course, has been used in the Orient for many thousands of years, and there's evidence showing that um, acupuncture or acupressure was known in Europe as long as 5,000 years ago, so it's been around for a long time. Also, if you think about, for example, the Japanese form of massage called shiatsu involves pressing on these acupoints. So um, the, in oriental medicine, they've known for a long time that pressure on the points or tapping on the points, like qigong has you do a lot of tapping on your body. So it's, it's there in Qigong, which is thousands of years old. It's there in acupuncture. It's there in Shiatsu. And so they, they've always recognized that you can use needles, but other forms of stimulation at these points are, are equally effective. And uh, a brilliant clinical psychologist called Roger Callahan in the 1970s figured out, late 70s, early 80s, figured out that, um, that if, you, if you add in this acupressure tapping to regular psychology, that your clients can have far more rapid results. So we still use a lot of the components of regular psychology. We use bits of gestalt therapy. We use uh, parts of what Sigmund Freud called talking, the talking cure. We use parts of cognitive therapy, parts of behavioral therapy. So we use components of all of those therapies, the best bits that we can find, the most effective parts of all those therapies. But we then add in this ingredient of, of acupoint stimulation. And what that does is it's as, as, as good as other kinds of therapy, but really much quicker. So we find, for example, that uh, clinical PTSD, severe PTSD, uh, like we, we work with thousands of veterans from Iraq, Afghanistan, and, and Vietnam, and we find that um, in an average of six one-hour sessions of EFT, 
their PTSD is just gone, and it stays gone thereafter as well. So it's effective for PTSD. We find that for phobias, like for a phobia of, of um, height phobia, claustrophobia, acrophobia, agoraphobia, <clears throat> fear of flying, all these kinds of phobias, we find that on average it takes only one session of EFT for the phobia to disappear completely. So it's a really effective therapy because it brings in the best of this oriental medicine and acupressure points along with the best of Western psychology. So we have a question in the chat room, um, and it's from Durha. I think that's how you say it. It's from the Big D. Anyway, so the question is, are there any foods that can cause negative energy to manifest in the body? I say that that's a very individual question because some people, for example, uh, seem to do well with foods that others don't do well with. And even certain foods that everyone needs, um, uh, some people need different amounts of. So I think it's less the food. Now, there, there's some foods clearly that I, I think are, you know, are, are just, just toxic. We mentioned sugar earlier. Uh, and you know, th- things, uh, Norm Sheedy, my mentor, says, look at the package. If it has more than two ingredients listed in the, in the, in the ingredients section, don't buy it. That's his personal. I'm not personal. <laughs> recommend that it. I'm not quite that rigid. I'll, I'll go ha- have a burger every once in a while. But um, but yeah, yeah. I, I'd say you know, s- stick to as natural as possible. Stick to organic, whatever you whatever you can. Uh, be sensible. But listen to your body. Sometimes your body may need more of a certain thing, less of a certain thing. And as you as you start to be driven by your body signals and not by cravings and habits you find your, your eating patterns will change dramatically and then might change over time. As you get older, they might change. As, you, as, as the seasons um, shift, they might change. In different, different geographical locations, you might be drawn to different things. When I go to, go to Hawaii, for example, which I do every year, I find myself irresistibly drawn to what are called butter avocados, these huge, giant avocados they have there. You can't even buy them elsewhere because they, they don't travel well, but they're these giant incredibly soft avocados. So when I go there, I just like the first thing I do is go, go grab some of that and some of the other Hawaiian dishes. So, so it, it's highly customized to you and to your body. Whenever you hear somebody say one size fits all, run in the opposite direction. <laughs> if they they, they okay. say my, my therapy is all you need. Well, this is a superfood. This is the crucial thing. This is, you know, this, this is the be all and end all. All you need is this, this kind of therapy. Uh, and that's it. Uh, then the, you know you, you have an unreliable source because um, we need... Or don't need listen to that person's therapy because they're wrong. It's like, I know. Mm. Yeah, and there's also rivalry among, among people saying, well, my, you know, this therapy is better, my therapy is good. Uh, you know, and, and the thing is, maybe it's good for some people. But like with EFT, for example, um, I told you that most veterans recover from clinical PTSD in six sessions, but... About 14%, 1-4% don't recover at all. They're as bad when they walk out after six sessions as they were when they walked in. Why? I don't know. Maybe they need some other kind of therapy. So um, the, if, mm-hmm. when you ever, ever hear sort of a, a panacea or inflated claims, just you know, go find something else because that, that's a signal of a quack. So we're going to shift gears here a little bit because I had this question for you and then we had this question come up in the chat room. Um, and it's about GMOs. And so my question, I'm going to just kind of mix them both together because I think you can answer them both at the same time. My question, you know, we were talking about like eating hot dogs and in the chemistry of the food that we eat. What do you think about, you know, the impact that GMOs are going to have on our genetic makeup? And then the question was, what does da- uh, Dawson think about recent cases of GMOs in the news? So GMOs, what do you think? What impact? GMOs. Do well, you think they're initially, I, I thought uh, I, I didn't see anything wrong with GMOs um, when they first came out, and um, it looked like reasonable science to me. But then as I've read more and more about them over the last while, especially during the big debate here in California of the proposition to, um, to uh, require GMO labeling of foods, um, there, there are studies which are very, very troubling showing things like sterility in rats, in animal studies, after several genera- up to three generations, to be precise, uh, of producing wow. uh, genetic genetic changes in in animals. Um, 
So even fairly innocuous changes in the, uh, the genes that are introduced into, into, into crops seem to sometimes have unseen consequences. So, you know, I don't know how within you know, 50 years or 100 years the debate will be over. We'll know uh, which GMOs are safe and which ones aren't. For the time being, though, I'm just being playing it, playing it safe myself personally, and we're sticking to organic foods for the most part, which we want to do anyway. Well, I mean, I just think that, you know, they're playing, you know, lab rat with all of us because they don't know, and then they're sliding it in. And unless you are, I mean, I try to be pretty careful, but I, I feel like you don't even know a lot of the times what you might be getting. Yeah, you know, and like, for example, if you eat corn in the U.S., you're almost certainly eating GMO corn. If you're eating soy in the U.S., you're almost certainly eating GMO soy. And uh, without that labeling requirement, you don't know. So, um, yeah. So initially, You know, I or thought, secondhand, you know, are they feeding the cows the corn that's making the milk that you're eating in your yogurt? Right. I mean, mm. But again, Rita, the, you know, the, the problem here too is that the whole the whole um, G- anti-GMO movement got caught up in kind of this um, wave of hysteria, where a lot of people opposing it were were you know they're opposing it very emotionally, and they weren't willing to look at the science. And so I think with any question, look at the science. Like when we were designing our weight loss program at the EFT Universe, um, we I looked closely at the science, and I got pretty mad because I realized that so much of the weight loss information that you see in magazines, that you see on websites, that you hear in, from, from various sources is wrong, harmful, and often way off base. And so, for example, um, so, so when we designed our own weight loss program, we just we threw out all of that stuff with just at the hard science. What's the, what's the science tell us? And we, we, we built our weight loss program around that, and it's, it's really simple. It's not that hard. It's actually pretty easy. But uh, look at the science behind it. Don't, don't, don't go for the folklore. You'll hear somebody, you know, there are, all, there are all these sort of urban legends that surround things like GMOs and weight loss and health and vegetarianism and all the rest of it. Uh, just be, be very suspicious of those sources. Uh, really delve into the science and see what the science says. And often it's, 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 it's maybe counterintuitive. But, but, but go there rather than, than the kind of the folklore approach, the, the old wives' tales. So let's talk about weight loss and, and weight, because that's a, a pretty chronic issue in the United States in general. And I know that in my own practice, I have quite a number of clients that come in either with their main complaint being weight loss or they, they would like to lose a few pounds but haven't really <clears throat> been yeah. successful at, being, at doing that. So how much do you think is weight loss associated with your calorie count or calorie versus energy expenditure or our emotional place? Well, the, the great debate used to be diet versus exercise. Is diet uh, the key to weight loss or is exercise the key to weight loss? And um, if you look at the research, the research is very, very clear that it's diet. Diet is the prime primary way to lose weight and not exercise. But exercise is really important and successful long-term weight loss people use, do exercise and do a lot of it. But uh, that, that, that's one of those things that is kind of a myth is that you know, they're both equally effective or is one better than the other. So, um, so that's, that, that's one of those factors. And yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a big problem. Um, pun intended, a third of the, the population <laughs> is overweight and another third is, uh, is, is obese. And only one third of the population is of a normal weight, and so it, it is, it's just this really staggering social problem. Also, being obese or overweight is associated with all kinds of health risks, like the increased risk, risk of diabetes, um, stroke, uh, heart disease, all kinds of problems that come go along with with being overweight. So, yeah, it's uh, it's, it's a big public health issue, and so we uh, we, we we've done we've now done three studies of EFT for weight loss. And what we focus on is the emotional component of weight loss because the reason you're sticking that candy in your mouth is not because you're hungry. It's usually <clears throat> because you're, you've got some kind of emotional thing going on. Maybe you're, maybe you're, you're, you're upset. Maybe it's a reward. Maybe um, you got it when you were young in, uh, 
in uh, in return for p- performing well, uh, maybe you use to console yourself. There are a huge number of emotional reasons why we eat, especially eat unhealthy things that have nothing to do with hunger. And so we find that with with with, with our EFT and weight loss program, we don't really try and give people dietary advice or steer them in any direction. All we do is we just say, look at the emotional aspects of how you eat. And usually when we do that, their whole eating pattern changes. So in one of our clinical trials we did of our, our weight loss program, we found that people lost an average of 12 pounds in our six-week program, which is nice, it's good. But our key focus wasn't on losing weight in the program. It was what happens after the program because most diets, people lose the weight and then they regain all the weight they've lost and more. So the long-term prognosis for people who lose weight is very poor. Most of them do regain all the weight back again and even wind up worse than they were before. But in our trial, we found that in the six months after they finished the program, so you get done with the program, lose 12 pounds, but in the next six months, they lost an additional three pounds. And in another clinical trial done by a colleague of mine at Bond University, uh, she tracked them for 12 months after the EFT program, and they lost an average of 11 pounds. So they kept losing weight after the program ended. And, of course, their anxiety went down, their depression went down, their whole mental health outlook improved. And, again, so much of our eating is emotional. So as your stress level goes down, as your anxiety and depression goes down, then if you're healthy, you reduce your mental health problems, and that has usually has a, a pretty automatic effect on, on diet and food intake. One of the things that you mentioned a little bit earlier, and I'd like to come back to it because this is something that I've seen in my, my larger clients, is that, you know, where they're not connected to their body, I mean, from a, an intuitive perspective, they look completely disassociated. You know, their body's in their chair, and their spirit is kind of looking out the window across the room. I mean, oh, they, yeah, there's right. really right. this huge separation. And, I mean, I don't know if you are familiar with, you know, that part. But could you speak on that a little bit? Because I think that it's really important how, because I don't think people realize that they, you know, they think, well, I'm here, I'm eating it, but there's there's not a consciousness, a level of there's consciousness. consciousness. Yeah. And that, that phenomenon you described, your body's here, but your, 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 uh, your awareness is across the room. And one of the, the, the uh, things we do in EFP workshops is, 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 is talk about integration and often parts of us do split off and do dissociate and do become detached from the main part of our psyche early on. And that's really often the, the only way we, we can survive as children, as young children, but then we wind up being older and still having these dissociative bits of ourselves that aren't integrated with our, our whole psyche. So it's really important to, to do those to do those exercises. Like, for example, in, in, our, in our weight loss program, <clears throat> it's called Skinny Genes, Skinny G E N E S, like genetics. And, uh, um, that's cute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, skinny genes. So, uh, the, the very first week, we have a whole section on what we call the concept from Gestalt therapy called Top Dog, Underdog, Ending the War Within. Because most weight loss and diet, uh, diet practitioners, they have part of their psyche saying, something to another part of their psyche and the top dog is saying something like you should lose weight you shouldn't eat that food you should uh, control yourself better. you should have more restraint that's the voice of top dog then there's the voice of underdog and underdog is saying oh yes top dog you're right I shouldn't eat that food I shouldn't I should have more restraint I should be a better person you're so right top dog and what uh, gestalt therapy tells us is that in this war between these two parts of the psyche, top dog and other dog, that one dog always wins the battle, and that dog is underdog. Because the moment top dog's back is turned, underdog toddles off on his four legs and goes and eats that piece of chocolate or that piece of cake, sabotages top dog's efforts to control him. So as long as you have this top dog, underdog model of diet and weight loss with one part of you trying to, uh, trying to control another part of your psyche, you have this war within your, your own being, and it is so unhealthy. So the first thing we do is have people love and accept themselves 
just the way they are. We, we don't want them to accept themselves only once they've lost 25 pounds. We want them to love and accept themselves at the weight they're at, uh, with all the problems they have in their lives right now. Now, paradoxically, when you accept yourself just the way you are right now, your stress level goes down. When your stress level goes down, we've done a clinical trial of EFT and cortisol, and it showed that your cortisol level after a one-hour EFT session drops by an average of 24%. Now, you know, now you tend to have less of this stress hormone. That stress hormone is the major contributor to belly fat. So now we, through EFT, we've dropped our cortisol, and so stress level goes down, and suddenly our metabolism starts to, to come into better regulation. So all of these things are related, the psychological, the emotional, the spiritual, the physical, the molecular, down to the level of which of our five trillion cells are producing which molecules. So we, you know, we, we're, 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 we're unitary beings, we're whole beings, and anything you can do to help that, that obese client who's got that split with half of them looking out the window while their body sits over here, anything to help them love themselves and accept themselves is really doing good service. Okay, I have another question in the chat room, but I have another topic that I want to get to, and I don't want to run out of time without at least touching on it for over five minutes. Anyway, so here's the question, just quick. Uh, so the question is from Lisa, and it says, when doing EFT, and so I guess she was doing EFT for herself, uh, for a physical thing, one day later, I got uh, a coincidence leading me to info that was helpful. Does EFT have a component of something that might be linked to universal consciousness? I uh, personally find my life is filled with synchronicities. It's uncanny. I'll think, gee, I'd like this, or I'd like to be in touch with this kind of a person. Like right now, I, I have to, for a project I'm doing next year, I have to find three world-famous athletes. Now, I didn't watch sports. I don't, I mean, I, I couldn't tell you the difference between, you know, I've never, I've never watched any, any kind of sports game, I think, through to the end. But, um, but just having that thought and having that, that, that desire, I can tell you that when this program launches in a year, we will have three major sports figures, world-known sports figures as part of the program. How? I have no idea. But, but it, it's just amazing to me that my whole life seems to run, run synchronously. So, um, yeah, again, but I think part of it too is when your stress level decreases, you start to notice the synchrony. You start to notice the little um, nudges life is giving you much, much more. But, yeah, your, your intentions become clearer. Your goals become much more congruent with your life purpose. And, uh, yeah, here, here at the Universe, we just kind of expect synchronicity to happen. That's just the way the whole, uh, the whole thing unfolds. Okay, so all of the major sports figures that are li here listening to Just Energy Radio, <laughs> whether live or in the archive, tell them that you heard it on my show because I want to get this straight. Michael okay. Jordan, if you're listening. That's right. Well, actually, I give this one to my mom, Derek Jeter. She, like, is totally in love with that guy. But, there uh, we go. He's a baseball player from the Yankees. Just well, in case you know. Oh, yeah, I see, yeah. So if you have your phone number, please pass it along. Yeah. Anyway, all right, so here's the question that I, I really would like to spend some time with you because we are talking about gene expression, and this has been all over the news recently, and I think it's a topic that needs to have some air from, in my opinion, a more sober mind. And that's the whole Angelina Jolie double mastectomy. <clears throat> I got the bad chromosome yeah. gene thing, so I'm just going to chop myself up. What, what do you think about that? I mean, I think it's crazy. That's my opinion. But what do you think about that whole thing? I mean, especially from a gene expression point of view. Yeah, and she was saying that she had two uh, gene variants that gave her a high probability of breast cancer. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it, and I, I don't feel think, uneasy. We don't have to pick on Angelina per se, but just that whole mindset they're, they're kind of putting out in mainstream medicine that, to me, is scary. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I, it, she, she's so influential, and what, where she leads, others follow. So that, I think, is the... Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure she gave a lot of thought to that as well before she did this, but um, what you learn in epigenetics is that 
just because you have the gene doesn't mean it's expressed. And um, we have huge numbers of genes that are dormant and that aren't expressed and are, that are triggered. If, for example, there was a famous amendment of prostate cancer done by Dean Ornish, and he took men with prostate cancer, and rather than them getting regular therapy, they got a totally natural intervention. They just met, to meditate. They walked for a half hour every day. They went on a low-calorie, low, a low calorie, low-fat diet. And just those shifts, over 500 genes shifted their expression with just those shifts, including their prostate cancer genes. Their prostate cancer genes were what's called down-regulated or turned off by, uh, by this, this, this very modest, um, just lifestyle-based change. So I think people tend to think about, you got that gene, you'll get the disease. Not necessarily so. Is the gene turned on or off? In um, one of my papers, I have some photographs of twins, identical twins. Now, if the, these kids are born with the same genome, the, the egg splits in two, are fertilized, and you have two babies born with exactly the same genes. The boy and the babies look alike. They look alike growing up. And what I show in one of my pieces of research is that um, when they're two or three, you can't tell them apart. By the time they're 20 or 30, maybe tell them apart. By the time they're 50, they look very different. And if you look at their gene expression map, which genes are turned on and turned off, huge numbers of genes are turned on or off in one but not the other. And their gene expression has diverged. Why? because of their lifestyle, because of stress, because of what they eat. So just because you have that gene doesn't mean it's turned on. And one of the pictures I've got in that, that paper is of two little girls, six years old. One has leukemia, one doesn't. One has cancer, one doesn't. They both got that cancer gene, but it turned on in one little girl and not in the other. And as doctors comb through their medical records and their life history to figure out why the cancer gene got turned on in one but not in the other, they found the answer was stress, that the one twin had had a negative experience at the age of six months. They think that that bad experience turned on their, 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 their cancer genes. So um, that, that's, that's really where I would go with this. I would really think about what you can do in your own life to support your health and well-being, your attitude, good, good emotions, good experiences, not going for the nuclear option of, of surgery. Well, and I think that's the piece that, I really feel needs to be heard by people or, you know, put out there is, I mean, I was reading a couple of articles and they said, well, the number of women that have that mutated gene is far vaster than they thought. And then I read another article that said, well, you have, <laughs> and this was flabbergasting to me, a five to 85% chance, five to 85% chance of it activating. I'm that's like, a big range. That's a huge range. Um, but I'm going to kind of move along on this topic. You made a comment, and let me ask this question as a follow-up. So if a gene turns on and is being expressed, you know, if being expressive negative or turns off and being turned off is negative, can you turn it back on and off so that it starts functioning properly again? You know, can you switch it the other way? I'll give you an example, again, based on stress hormones. So, um are, in my book, I go into this in, in more detail about DHEA and cortisol. So cortisol is your main stress hormone. It's a master hormone. It causes all kinds of changes in the body. And it's produced by your adrenal glands, just by your kidneys. So if you look at a cortisol molecule, it is made up of two precursors. And just I'm not going to get too complicated here, but the two precursors are pregnenolone and progesterone. So you've got these two molecules pregnenolone, progesterone, out of those two molecules, those are the two precursors, the two biological building blocks, out of those our body makes cortisol in the adrenal glands. Okay, so if you're stressed, you have high cortisol levels. Now, there's another molecule that looks almost exactly the same as cortisol, but has exactly the opposite function in our body, and that is DHEA. DHEA is your most common hormone, and it's your main cell repair hormone. It keeps you looking young if you have large amounts of it. It is associated with, with cancer in that people with cancer have low DHEA. So it, if you have low DHEA it, um, and high cortisol, 
your skin wrinkles faster, you lose bone mass and muscle mass as you age. So just as high cortisol is bad for you ongoing, high DHEA is really good for you ongoing because it's your main cell repair hormone, okay? But it's also produced by the adrenal cortex, exactly the same gland, same part of your body. Out of those same two precursors, progesterone and pregnenolone. So what happens is when you're stressed, you send a signal to your adrenal glands and that signal says, I'm stressed, make lots of cortisol. So it then starts to cannibalize all of those molecules, those precursors, progesterone and pregnenolone, to make cortisol and it starts to break down DHEA. So it's breaking down your cell repair hormone to make your stress hormone. Now, if you relax, like if you do EFT, in this cortisol study we showed that your cortisol drops. When your cortisol level drops, then your body disassembles that cortisol into free progesterone and pregnenolone, which is then available to make lots of DHEA. So it's, there's really a balance here, and your stress level, your emotions, your thoughts, your beliefs are tilting you toward one side of the continuum or the other with every thought and word and deed and experience. So I guess everybody needs to, I just want to let you know we have three minutes, so we're, I'm just going to kind of, we're going to wrap. Um, but I guess everybody needs to uh, kind of keep, pay attention to what they're thinking and what they're feeling and sing songs and meditate and, and work on keeping out of that stress zone. Absolutely. Do the thing. That's why I become so passionate about teaching EFT, because EFT is the thing I found. It's not, it's not a panacea. It's not, not the only thing out there. There are lots of good techniques out there. But I can teach to people in a few minutes, and like we have a free manual on our website, a mini manual. They go there, they download the manual, they learn EFT, and often we get people emailing us and they say, gee, I've, I learned this an hour ago and my headache went away, or I learned this an hour ago and suddenly I'm not worried about my job interview anymore. I learned this you know, yesterday and suddenly this, this really troublesome uh, habit or pattern or this old wound is healing. There's all kinds of stories like this. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a fan of anything you can do like that to, to support your health. And so where can, they can download that off of your website? Yeah, they can download the free mini manual if they go to eftuniverse.com. And then if they want to do skinny jeans, they go to skinnyjeansfit.com. And that's G-E-N-E-S, skinnyjeansfit.com. And we're starting the next uh, six-week program on July the 8th. And so is that you have to come? So is that in California? Is it available, oh, no, like, you know, online, anything like that? online. All online. Oh, even better. It's all online. And, again, people in our clinical trial shows they lose an average of 12 pounds in six weeks and then keep on losing weight as the most progress off of that. So it's fantastic effective <clears throat> yeah, based on, on emotional gain. Okay. I think, we, I think we lost him a little bit. So, okay, there we go. Again. Oh. There you go. Anyway, Dawson, thank you so much. I had a great time with you. And you like to come back. Oh, I'd love to. Anytime. And there's lots more about this. Thing. It's stress and uh, what we do to support our health is it's just a, it's a topic that I love sharing about. So whenever you want me, I'll be there. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to let you go because the music is going to come up here in a second. Okay? Hold that. All right. Bye, Dawson. That's Dawson Church. His book is The Genie in Your Genes. His website is EFTUniverse.com. And we're going to be back with Charlotte Zivik. Zivik. Charlotte. After these words from our sponsors. Just Energy Radio with your host, Dr. Rita Louise, will return right after these messages. 